All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's weird to hear your voice magnified. I will get used to this and we'll get going. So I'm talking on burning neural circuits, the acts of daily formation. And as potentially foolhardy as it might be for a research psychologist to come to a seminary and start a talk with scripture, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Foolhardy because I am out expertise in this area in a number of ways. Um, so in Paul's letter to the Romans, he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. As recorded in Luke, Jesus teaches that a good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And I want to start with these scriptures because these words reflect entire swaths of the discipline of psychological science, which should broadly be understood as the use of systematic empirical methods to describe, explain, and predict human thinking and behavior. So what I want to do in our time together is share my vantage point with you to share how I've been thinking about the contribution of psychological science to formation, to conversations about formation, the becoming of the person who behaves in a way that is consistent with their calling, whose heart is full of good such that it overflows in our words and our actions. Before I get into the psychology stuff, however, I need to lay bare my starting point. Formation is an embodied process. We can talk about spiritual formation, but we need to do so with a clear articulation that our engagement with the spiritual world is inextricably bound up with our bodies. Bodies are not tangential to who we are um, and to what we are uh, or how we know in the world. Bodies are central to all of those things. And so as such, if we want to think about what it means to develop toward Christ's likeness to be formed by the Holy Spirit, then we cannot ignore our bodies in that process. Although this is a wonderful and complicated and important conversation, I'm not actually going to go down the path of the significance of embodiment in our time together. I'm not going to talk about it um, in kind of general terms. But because I am talking about an embodied process, I find it important to start with this assertion as an explanation for why I don't frequently use the word spiritual formation. We cannot, as it were, tease out some single thread of our spiritual selves or tap into spiritual formation as something separate from the rest of us and the rest of our embodied existence and development. Our formation is not just about an intangible soul or spirit. I believe God's plan is larger than that, involving the formation and redemption of our whole selves. And so even if we want to hold on to that phrasing of spiritual formation, if we want to think about it as something other than physical bodily processes, we have to understand that it is in and through our bodies that we come to experience the world, that we come to uh, be in contact with what we perceive as reality. And our bodies, our perceptual systems, and our brain processes are what put us in touch with that reality. And so we cannot extricate ourselves from our enfleshed, embodied, and contextualized perspective. I also want to be clear that I am not reducing our formation to physical processes. We are certainly more than the sum of our cellular bits. So instead, I want to build from the starting point that says we need to engage science that tells us how the world works and to understand how our bodies work in that world, uh, because this, in, this engagement will enrich our understanding of the processes by which we form into or away from Christ's calling on us. This engagement does not say that we can understand the work of the Holy Spirit in purely physical terms, because we can't. 
And so a full and robust understanding of who we are requires thinking about those small microscopic bits, the chemistry, the physical laws that regulate matter. It also requires understanding how we engage in this world as the unit we call a person and how we connect and are interlinked with others in a way that extends beyond ourselves in relationship, community, and culture. And it's important that we do this because like a good cake, we've got layers, right? And all of the, the microscopic bits to culture are the layers of our personhood. And so although there is a time and a place for experts at all of these layers, I want to spend our time together in a relatively compact slice of this cake. Uh, in the time that remains, I really want to explore formation by examining what we know about the connection between our brains and our behavior. So to start to unpack the connections between our brains and our behavior with an eye toward understanding human formation, I want to give a very brief and incomplete crash course on how brains work, right? Don't leave yet, there's not a test. Uh, and so we're gonna start as a good scientist in my capacity would with a neuron. So brains are made up of billions of cells that we call neurons. Neurons work by receiving information in the form of a chemical called a neurotransmitter. Neuro neurotransmitters work to either excite the neuron, creating an electrical impulse that then gets sent on to communicate with other neurons, or to inhibit that electrical activity. So when a neuron receives a neurotransmitter that causes excitation, it initiates this electrical impulse that then is sent down the neuron, it creates neurotransmitters that are then dumped into the brain to be picked up by other neurotransmitters, or by other neurons, excuse me. And so every time we perceive, right, vision, hearing, tasting, smelling, every time we remember something, when we speak, uh, when we reason, when we do anything we might broadly put under this category of thinking, we have these processes of a neuron receiving information, sending electrical impulses, creating new neurotransmitters that are then received by other neurons in this system. And so perhaps you've seen a brain image that looks something like this. What this kind of brain image is telling us is that in the areas that are colored, this kind of activity is happening in the neurons. Right? It's an indirect measure, but it's telling us that there are these electrical chemical reactions happening in a system in that area of the brain. And what makes this important is that the behavior of neurons is happening at a large scale across the brain, giving rise to what we refer to as Hebbian learning, named after Donald Hebb, a, a famous neuroscientist. Hebbian learning is the idea that when neurons are active, right, receiving neurotransmitters, creating this electrical impulse, dumping out new neurotransmitters, continuing that message, when these neurons are active together, it strengthens the connection between those neurons. It strengthens the connections between themselves. This idea of Hebbian learning, that neurons get better at communicating with one another the more they communicate with one another, is what neuroscientists are referring to when they use this phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. Right, the firing is referring to this chemical electrical activity. And the wiring is the practice that they have talking to one another. So when neurons have practiced firing together, it makes it easier for them to fire together the next time. Uh, as, as an analogy, if you think about some forested area, you know, North Carolina, you guys have some good trees. I hear you're pretty passionate about those trees. I, good reason, they're beautiful. Um, so you have a forested area and you want to travel through and you want to create a, like a daily path. The first time you walk that path in these woods, it's going to be difficult because it's not a path that's been traveled before. But then if you travel it again the next day, clearing away a few more rocks, you know, moving some of the branches, maybe adding some sign markers, and then the next day, 
And then the next day, eventually you will have a well-established path, right? That's what your neurons are doing in your brain. At first, there is no kind of sense that these neurons would connect with one another, but the more there is this activity happening at the same time, the better established that path becomes. Right? So by you walking that path, you are creating a stable path that exists in that forest even when you're not there. That's what's happening in the neurons in your brain. With advances in technology, neuroscientists have been able to move beyond questions of where there is brain activity, like the image from the previous slide, to be able to ask more complex questions about the nature of the connectivity in the brain. So for example, this image is from the Human Connectome Project, which is a mapping of all the neural networks in the human brain. And it shows uh, the connectivity patterns of a thick slice of the midsection of the brain, kind of like imagine this section right here, that's what's uh, showing up there on the side. Uh, it's showing the pattern of different connections. The specifics aren't really important just to say that we've actually moved beyond just individual areas where there is activity to thinking about how these areas work together, how these neurons that have habitually fired together are now wired together. Hebbian learning suggests then that your brain changes as a function of its input. Input here referring to the things that your brain is processing, right? Just like the input in the forest is you walking that path, input that your brain receives are things you hear, things you say, things you read, things you do. That's the input that your brain is processing. So consider, for example, a now famous series of studies in cognitive psychology conducted by neuroscientist Eleanor McGuire and her colleagues in which they explored the structure of the hippocampus of London taxi drivers. The hippocampus is this kind of underneath the crinkly area, so it's a subcortical structure in the brain that's really understood to be the gateway between short-term memory, what you're thinking about right now, and long-term memory, things that you'll be able to recall at a later date. And so she and her colleagues found that taxi drivers who had passed the London licensing exam to be a taxi driver had larger memory centers in their brains. Their hippocampus was actually larger than average, but importantly, they didn't start that way. It's not that folks with large hippocampus are just like attracted into the taxi driver profession, but rather as a function of their practice, of the streets of London, they created these really complex mental maps and knew the streets better than anybody else in a way that was physically manifest in their brain structures. Um, and so in one study, she looked at taxi drivers who were trying to study for the exam and found that, you know, they had normal size hippocampi. Four years later, the ones who had passed this licensing exam had this incredible growth in the hippocampus. But she also had brain scans of folks who initially were trying, but they failed the licensing exam. And what do we see in their brains? No change in their hippocampus. So the fact that they failed the exam was because they didn't know it, a not knowing that was recorded in a not changed brain, if that, if that makes sense. So essentially, the study and the practice of the map of the twisted streets of London was physically reflected in the growth of neural connections. These neurons that had practiced firing together in the studying of the streets had now wired together producing an exceptional memory of the streets of London. Of course, this is good news for any student in the room who sits down with an open textbook and says, I'm never going to learn this, because it means that with enough effort and study, you can learn it, a learning that will be reflected in the physicality of your brain. Assuming that you sufficiently activate and practice the neural circuits that represent that knowledge. So this kind of memory is what we would call explicit. So if asked, what's the name of that street, a London taxi driver can bring that to mind. It's conscious and intentional. This kind of explicit memory is an important part of who we are and how we operate, but it's really not the majority of our memory system. So consider this. Your brain accounts for two to 3% of your overall body weight, 
And yet your brain is responsible for the consumption of 20% of the metabolic needs that your body has. So 20% of the calories that you give your body to feed it energy are used by 2% of your body mass. Right. That's, this, your brain is an energy hog in this context. And so because of this, your brain is constantly on mission to make its job easier, to get more efficient. That efficiency then can reduce the energy requirement for a particular task. So to the extent that it can, your brain does not just want to strengthen neural connections, firing and wiring together. Your brain wants to strengthen neural connections to the point where its activities are automatic, which is a massive reduction in energy cost. So it does this by putting neurons in networks that once activated trigger a cascade of activations rapidly, easily, and importantly, without explicit intention. Um, the kind of explicit intention that we see in explicit memory. So let's think about one of the ways that this can translate into behavior. It's not a personal story, I promise. Um, so imagine that you told your spouse you would stop at the store on the way home from work and you'd pick up some milk because you were out of milk. And you don't normally stop at the store on the way home from work, but you know this is like mission critical, right? The three-year-old needs the milk, okay? Um, and so you get in your car at work, right? You, not me, you. You get in your car um, and you think, I'm going to stop at the store and I'm going to get some milk. And then the next conscious thought you have was when you pulled into your driveway and you thought, I wonder what's, oh, where's the milk, right? So what happened in that context was that even though you had this really nice conscious intention to stop at the store and get milk, once you got into the car and you let your attention be distracted, you started mind wandering and your body's drive me home neural circuit took over and took you home on autopilot. This is what psychologists talk about when we talk about automaticity. So there are these automatic neural circuits that effectively got you to where you need, needed to go without bothering to let your conscious intention to stop at the store interrupt that process. So this is what brains do as often as they can. They take behaviors that you repeat regularly and create energy efficient neural networks that can follow the playbook that you've rehearsed without needing to bring each and every step to your conscious attention. So at one point when you drove home, it wasn't, con it, it wasn't something you could do on autopilot. The very first time you're thinking, okay, hey, what's the fastest way to get home? How do I avoid, you know, the, the crazy people drive on that street and like there's too many stoplights on that street. So what path am I going to take home? And it's conscious and you have to think about it. But eventually, after a handful of times of finding that pathway to get home, that's when it becomes an autopilot. Kind of, you don't even think about where you're turning right or left. You just do it because you've done it so many times before. For. This is really what I mean by burning neural circuits. The repeated practice of a behavior creates and stabilizes a neural connection that allows that behavior to happen without explicit intention or effort in the future. So your brain is in the business of taking your difficult, goal-directed behaviors, drive me home, and turning them into habits and actions that are performed automatically when the right situation and signals arise. And so because this might not be a real science talk without a flow chart, let's talk through these steps for a quick minute. So first, you have some exposure to new information, to a skill, or something that you want to practice, right? Some kind of behavior. With attention to and practice of that information or skill, your brain has an opportunity to co-activate the neurons that ultimately represent that learning, wiring together, firing together. And this ultimately results then in strengthened neural connections.
These neural connections then can either produce an explicit memory, such as, was, such as was the case with the London taxi drivers, or it can produce the kind of implicit memory that we can have and use without conscious intention or even awareness. As was in the example of driving home, with enough practice, some explicit memory can ultimately be practiced into automatically activated implicit memory. So although not all behaviors can be made automatic, right? We can't go on autopilot for everything we do. I want to suggest that many of our most important behaviors can be. And, and it, they can be made automatic in ways that might explain why we do the thing we hate, even when we know we hate it. And even if our behavior is not truly automatic in this kind of technical way that psychologists use this word around its definitional boundaries, there is still a great, uh, great deal of deliberate control and intentional thought that gets offloaded through this process. I really want to let the potential implications of this sink in here. The things that you do get recorded as neural patterns that make the doing of that behavior easier the next time. And moreover, it's not just that it makes them easier to do, it turns these behaviors, or many of these behaviors, into automatic, unintentional behaviors that just happen when the right circumstance arises. So you didn't need to think about driving home when you got into your car after work, your brain was already on the job. And so it didn't bother to interrupt with your original conscious intention of stopping. It's like setting up a row of dominoes. Once that first domino starts the topple effect, it's really difficult to disrupt the falling of those dominoes. Not impossible, but really difficult. James K.A. Smith wrote that love that attracts us to God is something that grows through practice and repetition. If we want to pursue God, we need to immerse ourselves in rituals and rhythms and practices whereby the love of God seeps into our very character and is woven into not just how we think, but who we think we are. Although it might sound unfamiliar in a church context, I think it an important question. What kinds of behaviors, what kind of character are your daily practices, your daily activities, what are they burning into your neural circuits to produce and bring forth a little bit easier tomorrow? At this point, it might be tempting to do what so many of us do. Think about these big ticket moments where we responded with virtue and say, aha, there's that right neural circuit. But what a neural perspective compels us to do is to look at the small, seemingly insignificant moments of our lives and care about them. Your brain is active all the time, even when you're sleeping. Fun fact, the primary difference between a brain that is awake and a brain that is asleep is that the awake brain is tethered by external input. That's the only difference. The external input just kind of changes what is on your mind, not what your brain looks like. And so the neural patterns are mostly indistinguishable between those two states. And so this means that when we wash the dishes, when we hold open the door for a stranger, when we share a kind and encouraging word, our brain is active, recording those things. It also means that when we respond to our children in frustration, when we drive impatiently, I'm from California, when we drive impatiently, or when we share, you know, small gossiping words, our brain is active, recording these things. In all of these cases, what might amount for only moments in our day, our brain is recording and supporting that activity. And if done with some regularity, again, even just the regularity of minutes in a day, your brain will get the message. This is the kind of repeated practice behavior that I want to make efficient, so let's get to burning that neural circuitry. <laughs> 
So what I've described is true for behaviors that are worthy of our calling, the playing out of our formation into Christ-likeness, and at the same time, it's true for when we are formed otherwise, when we establish behavior patterns that we hate and yet continue to do. When we look at our words and actions and wonder if this is a true reflection of the heart within us. So research drawing on the connection between our brains and our behavior suggests that we need to care about these little moments. And I think the right next question is, does this research also offer any ideas about what we should do about this. How do we better care for these little moments? And this is where I wanna spend the remainder of our time. I wanna sketch out some initial ideas from psychology and neuroscience that might provide a language and an inroad to thinking about how we can have a heart or a character defined by neural networks that produce good, that move us toward a behavior that is what we actually want to do. We could give a whole talk on each of the talking points that I want to present, as well as probably others that I'm not going to talk about at all. But my goal here is not to provide some kind of airtight articulation of what to do, but rather to provide a framework that might be useful for our thinking, reflection, and neural network creation. One of the first places that I think we should start when trying to leverage this understanding of how the brain records and produces future behavior is in the study of attention. Research on habit formation is particularly relevant here because habits refer to those kinds of automatically activated behavioral cycles. Although we might not think of honesty or generosity or patience as habits, from a brain-based perspective, there is nothing qualitatively different about an honest behavior relative to a dishonest behavior. They are both simply activating the relevant neural circuits to produce the desired, practiced outcome. Work on habit formation explores the transition from goal-directed behavior, right? This is you saying what it is you want to do, so habit formation explores the transition from that kind of statement, intentional willing of behavior, to automatically controlled behavior, which is what we've been talking about as these burned neural circuits. And so when we start out with an intention to do or learn something over and over time with practice, our brain does what our brain does, and it removes the need for conscious control. And so in this sense, a habit can be both automatic and intentional, at least intentional at the start, right? So when I got into my car in this fictional story, when I got into my car and I started driving, I intentionally got into my car. That was an intention. And then the habit took over. And at that point, kind of from that point on, was automatically activated. And so the key difference between an automatic behavior on one side and a goal-directed behavior on the other is the amount of attention and intentional control that we exert. And so we can think about this from several different directions. When we pay attention and have the intention to do something, and we have a map to get there, we are more likely to automate that behavior or to create a habit. This is good when it's a habit that we want to make. Right? We are capable of making these kinds of habits. On the flip side, it also means that we can look at some of our problematic behaviors and habits and reintroduce intention to our conversation and our internal reflection in an effort to disrupt and replace the problematic habit. And so what you might be thinking I'm saying at this point is the, the solution is to just pay attention to what you're doing. That's not actually what I'm saying. I really wish that I could tell you that and just like let that be the message. Pay attention to what you're doing and we'll all live better lives um, following the commands of Jesus. Um, unfortunately, we, if I were to say that, we would all be bound for failure because we don't have the capacity to pay attention to everything. Our attentional systems are really limited. So the question really is, how do we leverage the limited amount of attentional capacity that we have to disrupt our problematic habitual cycles toward unvirtuous behaviors? Right? How do we leverage our attention that is available to us to effectively deploy and direct our attention toward self-control? Uh, and so instead of just telling you to pay better attention, uh, I want to give you three strategies 
that we can use, again, as a framework, not an airtight, like, go and do this and your life problems are going to be solved. That's not what I'm saying. But what are three strategies that we can use grounded in empirical science to think about how to better deploy the attention that is available to us when it comes to us doing the thing we want to be doing? And so the first thing that I would suggest might be a little counterintuitive, because I'm telling you to use your attention to direct your self-control, but the first thing I want to tell you is to remove the need for self-control in the first place. Um, research shows that um, for better or worse, the best way to exert self-control is to not have to use it in the first place. And so that means you pre-organize your world in a way that limits the amount of self-control that your world is going to require of you. This is actually one of the biggest differences between people who have high levels of self-control and low levels of self-control, is that those with the highest levels of self-control are better able to structure an environment that doesn't require they use the self-control they have. Um, and so what I would suggest is that if you're looking at a behavior that you're consistently repeating, and like Paul, you're like, why do I keep doing this thing that I hate? I would encourage you to, when you are not in the midst of that behavior, really reflect on what brings that behavior about. What are the triggers of that neural cascade that make it so? Right? What are the environmental, the behavioral, the relational triggers that make it so? And ask yourself, can you reshape your environment before that behavior occurs so as to remove that as an option? So when you think about this thing that you hate, this sinful tendency that festers and just pops up, one way to think about surrendering this sin to Christ is to change your situation. And what this might mean is that you have to give up some way of being in this world that isn't in and of itself sinful, but for you leads you down the neural network path of a sin that follows. A second thing that we can do is monitor our cognitive load. So cognitive load is the word that psychologists will use to talk about when we are just maxed out. There is too much on our mind. I mean, things are like falling out of our ears and we're just trying to catch them on post-its as they fall out, right? This is cognitive load, high levels of cognitive load. And so in many ways, this suggestion to monitor your cognitive load is really just a specific manifestation of the first suggestion. When we are overwhelmed and overloaded, it is so much more difficult to deploy our self-control. And so I would encourage you, in order to better regulate and monitor your cognitive uh, load, to think very carefully about how you engage in the world. How and when do you multitask, which is a way of increasing cognitive load? How much silence do you have, a way of decreasing cognitive load? And what are the situations that make you say, I just can't do this all? What are those situations? And so like the first suggestion, spend some time before the crisis, before the problematic behavior, before you have a need to exert self-control, um, spend some time to surrender the things that overwhelm your, co your rational cognitive system and direct your attention elsewhere. And so think about and surrender maybe your need to multitask and your need to be distracted. Um, surrender these things so that instead you can be present and mindful toward what, is God, toward what God is calling you to. My third suggestion here. Um, is to learn effective emotion regulation strategies. Uh, and I think that this is a really effective way to deploy our attention. I can definitely unpack this a little bit more in our discussion, uh, discussion time, but what we believe and what we do is very tied up with our emotional experience, an experience that is automatically activated. Uh, and the sooner we can understand that we have feelings but we are not our feelings, the better we are empowered to use our emotions as information to inform without automatically driving our subsequent behavior. Again, maybe this is just me, 
But some of my most recalcitrant sins are those that happen in response to others, an unkind word spoken in response to hurt or anger that I feel, a brash response born out of anxiety or fatigue. And so the better I practice cognitive diffusion, which is this term that says I can think about my emotions without becoming one with my emotions, if you will, right? Like I have anger versus I am angry. One is at a slight distance that's diffusing the emotion from me. I am Aaron and I have this feeling of anger and now I can analyze it and think about this. Is this the kind of anger that is propelling me to meet an injustice? Or is this the kind of anger that's actually born out of my pride and perceived slight? Right? And so I can actually think about this. Uh, and the better I practice this kind of cognitive diffusion, the better I can disrupt whatever neural circuit is activated to encourage and propel my automatic behavior that I might be inclined to play out when I say, I am angry, versus I have uh, the feeling of anger. Emotion regulation is really another form of self-control, um, and it's a form of helping to regulate our cognitive load. It's like cognitive load management. Before I move on from attention, I want to say that whenever I think about the role of attention in my formation, I think about when Elijah went up to the mountain in the presence of the Lord. Right? So Elijah endured this powerful wind, this earthquake, and a fire, but the Lord was not in those things, um, those massive attention-capturing things. Instead, the Lord came in a still, small voice, and I think about when Dallas Willard writes that God does not ordinarily compete for our attention. And I think about the admonition to the church in Philippi to think on what is true, honorable, and pure, to think on things, to pay attention to things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Give these things your attention to shape who and how you are becoming. It's more than just nice wall art on an entry to a home. Right? This is actually when we direct our attention to these things, they shape and reshape the very biological essence of our being. Intentionally create the space where you can direct your attention to hear that still small voice because you have practiced and developed a behavioral pattern that makes hearing possible. So I stand behind all three of those suggestions, and these are things that I actively try to do in my own life. Uh, but I would also add that the way I've presented them, it sounds a little bit solitary, like you could just kind of engage in them by yourself, lock yourself in a room, and like direct your attention, ta-da, then you're, you're formed. Um, but really, research across a number of domains in psychology would indicate that humans were not designed for solitary activity. So for example, research suggests that when we make our intentions public, I want to do this thing, I have this goal, I want to be more patient, whatever, whatever the thing is, when we make our intentions public, we are more likely to follow through with them. Right? A little bit of social shame if we don't, that's a good healthy thing in this context. Um, and so that's one important role that our social world plays. But research goes far beyond that in terms of how our relationships work to facilitate our behavior and ultimately our formation. So at the risk of throwing out a bunch of terms without giving them time or sufficient exploration, I want to suggest that our relationships influence our formation in at least two critical ways. So the first way that our relationships shape our formation is perhaps the most obvious, the one described by attachment theory. So attachment theory describes the creation of um, neural tracks that tell us if I am lovable and loved, if I am capable of loving someone else, and what kind of world we live in. Is vulnerability something that, I, I, that I'll be safe if I am scared and say that, or is vulnerability something that's going to be exploited? And the neural tracks for those kinds of templates, which we can call attachment filters, are really laid down in our first caregiving relationships. Right? Um, and so this is why, what attachment theory really focuses on. But these early attachment patterns with our parents and our caregivers, 
then get carried into our relationships with our friends and later into romantic partner relationships. And they ultimately shape our understanding of ourselves, other people, and the proper way that we ought to relate to one another. Our early attachments are not deterministic. Remember, neurons that fire together wire together. So if they stop firing together, eventually they'll stop wiring together. That's what we talk about when we say neural plasticity, right? So we can shape and reshape the networks that are in our brain, but this takes time, effort, and attention. And so instead, rather than kind of recreating all of these neural patterns about relationships, we take the one that we have and we bring it into new relationships. Um, and so we understand the relationship and the world in front of us according to what we've experienced in the past. And so you can think about differences between secure and insecure attachments, some of the language that psychologists use. And if I have had a pattern of consistent caregiving as a child and then friends that were there for me when I needed it um, and people I could go to when I was experiencing stress or duress that kind of secure attachment I carry with me. And so when I meet somebody new, I carry those same basic expectations about the way relationships work. And we can flip the script when those things don't exist in the case of neglect or abuse um, or, or deprivation. And so these beliefs about ourselves and others in the world, they're deeply formative in terms of our understanding of the right way to live and even our sense of who God is. And attachment is predictive of a number of general psychological variables, some of which are directly related to these kinds of behavioral manifestations we might associate with fruit of the spirit. So attachment articulates how we represent and rely on our internal representations of people out there in our engagement with the world around us. In what is sometimes called extended cognition, research has demonstrated that we represent close relationships in our brains as extensions of ourselves, not as something wholly separate from ourselves. So we draw on these others that we carry around in our minds when we experience stress or weakness or temptation. When we have, when we have others in our neural codes and in our minds, we expand ourselves in ways that provides more and different ways of being. So for example, in my stress before this event, I drew strength in thinking about my husband's steadfast encouragement. He is not here with us, but he is certainly in here. And I represent him and his encouragement as an extension of myself. Um, and so I can carry around the strength that he has afforded me as a scaffold for my own capacity because he's in here. In a community of others who are encouraging and spurring our formation toward the ways of Jesus, we have capacities that supersede what our own good planning, intention, and attention alone could do. A second way that relationships are vital to our formation is in how communities shape and mold our narratives. So Sarah Schnitger and her colleagues have persuasively argued that virtues, which we, I might want to think about as Christ-likeness, this kind of formation that we've been talking about, that virtues are possible when we marry habitual ways of being, these kind of characteristic adaptations, automatically activated processes that we're talking about, when we marry those to a narrative identity, the stories we tell about ourselves, to ourselves as well as to others, when we marry these habitual ways of being to a narrative identity that says life is bigger than you, when those two things come together, that makes virtue possible. So they follow McIntyre's argument that virtues can only be enacted and, in and formed in the context of a community-based narrative that supports their importance. So basically, they argue that virtues are born when all the things I talked about on, our, on the previous slide with attention are combined with the power of community-given narratives that prescribe who we are and what kinds of things people like us do. The, these transcendent narratives, such as our core to Christian's calling, um, work because we can understand a person or their form, um, because we cannot understand, excuse me, a person or their formation when removed from the community and context in which they are embedded. So we own our narratives 
but we do not generate them on our own. And so I think that what both of these discussions highlight is the necessity of Christian community, not a see you next Sunday kind of community, but a vibrant, living, dynamic, and invested community, a community that eats together, that prays together, that sings together, that confesses together for the sake of healing. Um, And so we need to ask, who is shaping our attachment filters in this community, these filters that regulate how we engage in the world? What community provides our connection to a transcendent narrative about who and whose we are? Who are we carrying around in our neural networks, and what kind of narrative are they giving us about who they are calling us to be? And I think these are some of the most pressing questions about the role of relationships in our formation. And so from a brain-based perspective, the Christian who says it's me and God is really missing the fact that the scriptural call for gathering is not just another rule to be followed, but it's essential to our very core being and becoming. Likewise, the church leader who wants transformation by correct knowledge, let me just download what I know into your head, is likewise failing to see how our thinking actually follows our doing in the context of community. Um, Right views surely matter, and attention to scripture, such as in memorization, is transformative, but it's not transformative because we have more head knowledge. It's transformative because the memory occupies neural networks that when we speak, scripture is likely to come out. And then we think, I said that, I should do that, right? Because we want to be unified beings. Um, When I was in college, I I was having a really hard time. I don't even remember the specifics, but I remember having a phone call with my dad and saying, I'm having a really hard time. And so he told me um, in in a way that only my dad could. He said, well, Aaron, you know, just keep persevering because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And I said, oh, dad, that's really good. Will you say that again? So I wrote it down on a post-it and I put a little like, you know, the quote attribution dad on it. And some of you are laughing because you know where this is going. And I had it on my wall for probably a couple years before one day I was reading in Romans 5 and I was like, those words are familiar to me. But the thing is, is that my dad was the kind of guy who had so embodied what the scripture was that I couldn't differentiate his words from scriptural words. And to me, that is a great example of this kind of transformation. And now I know these words that have been, that have been given to us in scripture, but communicated to me first in this real embodied, tangible way through the voice of my father. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that, even if some embarrassment that I didn't know it was actually a scripture verse, right? And so I suppose at this point, I should return to a place near where I started. Formation is an embodied process. So what we do gets recorded in our neural networks in a way that facilitates the redoing of that behavior again next time. So we can and do record sinful or virtuous ways of being, and yet we have tools at our disposal with our attention, emotion regulation, and relationships. And we have an opportunity to use these tools in the context of God's invitation to participation and formation toward Christ-likeness. We are active participants in our own formation even if we are not initiators of it. So when we understand the bodies that God gave us, we can reorient ourselves with that knowledge to help live consistent with God's calling on our lives. Um, I, I mentioned to a class I was speaking to this morning that Dallas Willard said, grace is opposed to earning, not effort. When we understand that even in our micro moments, we are laying the neural tracks burning the neural circuits of our formation, we realize that the call is not just for these big, grandiose moments, but for the small and seemingly insignificant moments in between that form and shape us, the small moments that are the daily moments of our formation.
And it's with that that I want to thank you for your attention. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.